Okay. Now, in the June of 1830, uh, whilst in London, the 60-year-old William Wordsworth was invited by the journalist William Jordan to attend the Royal Academy uh, annual summer exhibition at Somerset House. Uh, Wordsworth, by now, was quite a, um, a, a, a how would you say, um, a, quite a confident art critic of the arts of that, and he was confronted by J.M.W. Turner's portrait, Jessica. His immediate response was, um, it looks to me as if the painter has indulged in raw liver until unwell. Jordan, Jordan himself had described the work as decidedly the most worthless and extravagant whim which he, Turner, had amused himself. Now, despite the painting's likely homage to Rembrandt's uh, series of works um, uh, open, of women at open windows, it drove the most visceral of uh, criticism of any Turner painting to date, as if Turner had afflicted himself with jaundice of the retina and the morning chronicle re relabeling the, the painting The Lady Climbing Out of a Mustard Pot. <laughs> Well, in fairness, uh, respect, in respect, uh, Wordsworth uh, certainly Turner got off lightly. Had he exhibited the painting only three years previously, he would undoubtedly received a more, provided more sufficient ammunition for one of mo his most vocal critics, Sir George Edmund uh, Howland Beaumont, uh, who, aside from being a patron of Wordsworth, was one of the leading art collectors, connoisseurs of his generation, as well as being an amateur painter of some note. Now, Beaumont's death in 1827 marked the end of a remarkable creative relationship that he had with William Wordsworth, and, and his relationship with the family through correspondence, which had spanned nearly a quarter of a century. His sister Dorothy, Wordsworth's Dor sister Dorothy, had wrote, his death was a great affliction and was one of severe shock to us, whilst Wordsworth said he had left a gap in private society and the public was not without important reasons to honour his memory. In life, his passion and persuasion in the art world saw Beaumont elevated amongst the highest artistic circles. He was friends of uh, Sir Joshua Reynolds, George Romney, Gainsborough, Thomas Gainsborough, Richard Wilson, to name but a few. He also um, imparted his knowledge and advice to, uh, to um, the up-and-coming uh, artists of the day, such as Thomas Goethe and John Constable and Benjamin and Robert Hayden, who I'll, I'll touch upon later. However, his life was not without controversy, being caught up in the Venetian secret scandal which duped even Benjamin West, the uh, president of the Royal Academy at that time, as well as his establishment of the British Institution of Art as a rival society to the Royal Academy. Nevertheless, in death, his crowning achievement was to bequeath a set of paintings by the old masters, amongst them Claude, Poussin, Rembrandt and Rubens, which had formed the core for the collection which is now known as the National Gallery, a place of pleasure and artistic education. Now, George Howland Bolan was born to a family of landowners in Great Dunmo, Essex, in about 1753. It was, not a it, was not, it was a comfortable life for um, uh, the young landowner's son, if not a wealthy existence. At the age of nine, he inherited, her inherited the baronetcy of the Cole Orton, Collie Orton in Leicestershire, a dilapidated uh, hall surrounded by coal mines. It was a very much a ch solitary childhood for the young Beaumont, and uh, escaping from the family glo the gloom of the family home of the clock house to the hallowed halls of Eton seemed to have fired his imagination for his passion for the love of the arts and also for drama as well. At Eton, he took uh, drawing lessons by Alexander Cousins, uh, father of the fam famed watercolourist uh, John Ro Robert Cousins. Um, uh, Cousins actually ran a little uh, drawing school above uh, a barber's. And uh, the monochrome uh, application that uh, we see in uh, some of Alexander Cousins' work seemed to have an enduring um, impact on on uh, Beaumont's paintings and drawings throughout his life. They're very, uh, very using a very dark palette, uh, very melancholic as well. Now, Alexander Cousins, uh, one of his pupils was George III, and in 1768, oops, I'll just go back to that for a minute. In 1768, he, uh, uh, he, he became the royal patron of, um, of the Royal Academy of Arts. At its helm was, it, uh, sorry, I should say, uh, it was. The purpose of the Royal Academy of Arts was very much to elevate the professional status of the artist through sound grounding in te technique and judgment of good taste. And at its helm was uh, President Sir Joshua Reynolds. Under Reynolds, Reynolds, there was a very much a strict hierarchy of, uh, which placed history and portrait painting at the top through promotion of the grand style or the grand manner. And this is a typical Reynolds portrait uh, in which uh, it's full length. And, uh, the subject matter or the sitter is a 
either draped in sort of uh, clothing of antiquity or set in a, in a background with classical motifs, so to actually ennoble and ennoble the being. Reynolds wrote a series of lectures or discourses on art delivered win each winter between 1769 and 1719, aimed, aimed to instruct the aspiring artist. Uh, these were published in 1798, and Wordsworth himself acknowledged the ad in the advertisements the, for the collaborative work with Coleridge of the lyrical ballads. An accurate taste in poetry and all the other arts, Sir Joshua Reynolds has observed, is an acquired talent which only can be produced by severe thought and a long continued intercourse with the best models of composition. Now, Wordsworth himself, before, even before he had met Beaumont, was, un was not, uh, not unfamiliar with art appreciation. In Revolutionary France of uh, 1791, he had sought out Charles Le Brun's uh, uh, Magdalene, the Repentant Magdalene, um, which he recollects in the prelude as a beauty exquisitely wrought, face, fair face, and rueful, rueful with ever flowing tears. Wordsworth, very much then sympathetic to the ideals of the French Republic, found the painting more moving than visiting the ruins of the Bastille for the first time. However, what about landscape? Landscape very much was considered low down the scale in terms of the hierarchy of a painting in Britain, uh, being beneath genre painting and slightly above animal painting. It was something to, for, the, for the everyday life. It was, uh, it was something to me merely use as a means for background. Nevertheless, um, in the 17th century, there was a, some of the, the be most beautiful landscape paintings came out of Italy and France, and particularly Claude Lorraine. Uh, this one particularly was owned by by Beaumont, and this is a um, um, landscape with Echo and uh, Narcissus. There's a Narcissus chair just uh, gazing into the pool there for eternity. Um, and uh, it was a different type of landscape. Like, uh, Claude was very much a formalized landscape in the respect that uh, it was a, it was, there was a, a cleanness about it. And also the beauty of the natural light really um, captured people's attention. And they were very popular when they came, were, were first arrived in England. Uh, now, the, the, probably the, um, the earliest exponent of uh, Claude's influences was Richard Wilson, the Welsh painter, um, and he uh, he'd studied in, in studied in Italy, and he'd been he came under the influence of Claude. And this is his uh, destruction of the children of Niobe. Very much these lands, these beautiful landscapes were used to, for a, for a background for mythological narratives or, or biblical scenes. And the destruction of the uh, children of Niobe actually ended up in uh, one of Beaumont's collection. It was donated to Tate, but unfortunately was destroyed in, in World War II. This is actually a, um, another copy after, after the original. Now, Richard uh, Beaumont himself had encountered works by Wilson in 1771 while spending time in, in London. He met Thomas Woollett, the engraver, who was etching Wilson's uh, destruction of the children of Niobe. Um, he also formed and became a lifelong friendship with Wallet's pupil, the engraver and watercolorist Thomas Herm. It's around that time as well that he purchases his first oil. This is a, a, a landscape painting by uh, Thomas Jones, another, another Welsh landscape artist. And it refers to the, to the legend of the final bard of Scotland. Uh, in the, and the, here we have um, the, the bard uh, contemplating suicide as a... Uh, the army of Edward I advanced in the, um, across, the, across the border in, in 1282, sorry, just uh, put myself there. The, bar the bard was a poet, storyteller, under the patronage of a monarch or nobleman. And at this early stage, now, he only, what, Beaumont's only 18 when he purchases so it. I'm, I'm just wondering, it's such a poignant painting, as he, he's actually envisaging probably this is what his, his life is going to be after, this is his, his, his purpose in life, to be a patron of the arts. Certainly the barren swind swept branches and foreboding stark mountains uh, allude to a dramatic landscape of another 17th century painter who Beaumont admire, admired, which was Salvatore Rosa. And you can see a, a, an example of this in the, one of the um, Salvatore Rosa's paintings from the 17th century. He was not only a painter or a poet, but at least one, one of my kind of count, uh, a bandit as well, <laughs> whose eye for the sublime captivated Beaumont's imagination. He actually, Beaumont actually owned uh, also 12 drawings by Rosa as well. Uh, now in 1777, uh, it, was a, it was a very important year for um, uh, uh, Beaumont, um, namely for three things. His friend, Bo his friend Bowles had constructed a new theatre in the family home of the, um, of the North Aston home, where they would put on uh, Shakespeare dramatisations. 
And uh, of the audience that came was a young lady called Margaret Wills, uh, a friend of the a friend of the friend of the Bowles family. The stage-struck baronet was now love-struck, and after a brief courtship, the pair were married in the spring of 1778. The period also marked his first acquaintance with uh, Joseph Farrington, landscape painter, but more properly famous now for his, his diaries of uh, the life at the Royal Academy, as well as being on mem a member on a number of committees, including the Hanging Committee. Right, and, and his diaries do provide a remarkable insight into the art world of Georgian and Regency Britain. Thomas Hearne actually invited Beaumont on a sketching tour of the north of England. It was to be the first time that uh, Beaumont was to experience the lakes. He returns here in 1778 as a honeymoon. Um, this left, the lakes left an indelible oppression on Beaumont, as if the sublime drama he found in Salvatore Rosa's landscapes could become transcribed to the view of the wind and rain wet, swept mountains of the Lake District. Hearne and Beaumont were jo joined by Joseph Farrington, and it's actually uh, Beaumont and Farrington here. Unusually, actually, for a painting with full canvas in, in, in plan air. It's something that, you know, Constable would, would, would do, do a little bit later. Um, Beaumont's own sketches of the, of the tour do, do not survive. However, uh, looking at the, uh, the, the, uh, the challenge of painting plan air on quite a precarious viewing point shows a growing confidence in Beaumont as a potential professional painter. Of course, then, another important ma thing that happened in 1777 was his acquaintance with Sir Joshua Reynolds, who he'd only known very fleetingly, probably met him as a boy. Reynolds certainly warmed very quickly to Beaumont's charm and eloquence of thought in discussing painting and soon advised him on good practice and technique in art. These are some of the, uh, see, these are a couple of uh, sketches, wash sketches from um, uh, Beaumont's uh, later trips, about 1798 to uh, to um, the Lake District. Anybody recognise this view? <laughs> Anyone like that has an exact guess? <laughs> We've got Helm Crag over there, so it's a view of Grasmere. And, uh, and this is Derwent Water with uh, Castle Crag in, in, in the distance. 1781, 1782, uh, uh, Margaret and George um, went on the, the, uh, the famous grand tour of Europe. And this was, cha this was to change uh, Beaumont's um, uh, view of view on art. He returned to London um, after meeting uh, John Robert Cousins. And some of his, some of his uh, works were started taking a more translucent approach in washes. But he was still challenged uh, to find his own feet as, a, as an artist. He, it's engaged, nevertheless, with uh, the, low, the connoisseurs of the time. And in 1784, he became a member of the Dilettanti, the Dilettanti Society, sorry, excuse me, um, which is a, a, a society of uh, uh, connoisseurs. And he meets Uvdell Price, who was who's one of the foremost uh, um, people on, uh, on talking about the picturesque, which somehow lay between the sublime landscape and the classical landscape. It was a landscape of that was allowed for, for a certain artistic license. If you, you could always add a, a rock here or a rock there or add a castle or a ruin or a ruin as, su as such. But more and more, it seemed to be that uh, Beaumont was more engaged with collecting art. Uh, the death of Joshua Reynolds in 1792 gave Beaumont opportunity to further his collection. Uh, this is actually an oil painting of uh, just a, a landscape scene of, um, uh, by Beaumont. See, he's working with a darker palette as, as usual. Being in, in Italy, he did, he'd he done come under the influence of Claude himself, and this is one of his other Claude paintings. This is Hagar with the and, and the Angel, a landscape of Hagar and the Angel. You can see it on display in the National Gallery, and it was it was basically um, it was basically uh, Beaumont's uh, little darling. Really, he carried it wherever he went uh, when he went on his travels between uh, Dunmo and Collyorton and length and breadth of the country. It's quite a challenge, one, one would imagine, if you've taken an oil painting of that, that size. Um, but nevertheless, it, it, it had benefits um, in, the, uh, in the fact that uh, whilst in 1795, whilst uh, visiting his mother in Dead and Vale, Bowman became acquainted with young John Constable, and he had taken residence up there. Um, and uh, Constable was very enthusiastic about the drawings of her and Thomas Gerty and sketches by uh, Beaumont himself. Uh, there we are, we have a self-portrait of a very confident looking John Constable. And this is, a, this is of the Estour River in Dedham by Beaumont himself. But it was actually uh, the confidence that uh, Beaumont had in Constable, or developing as an artist, that he actually loaned 
this, this wonderful floor painting. Uh, so a, a constable could study for it. But later Beaumont were, um, the problem with us with, with constable was he was not easily persuaded to pursue a formulated landscape. In, in Constable's own words, he said, when I sit down to make a sketch I, from nature, the first thing I try to do is to forget that I ever seen a picture. As I said, Beaumont's own art was struggling. He was, he was trying to find a particular style, and uh, it didn't really help him much when in, in 1796 he was approached by the Royal Academy's president, Benjamin West, who uh, purported to have discovered through a con artist, Thomas Provost, the formula of the Venetian secret, and that was the key to replicating the vivid color and the luminosity that it found in the Venetian school of paintings like Titian, Bellini, and Veronese. I think I do have a Titian, uh, Bacchus and Ariadne, um, again on display in the National Gallery. Beaumont West and other members of the Academy would, who were duped were became, became subject for ridicule, both publicly and within the Academy themselves. And certainly James Gilray spared no expense in depicting an alarm Reynolds arising from his tomb and Beaumont uh, depicted as a flatulent putty in the following uh, scene. Uh, this is uh, basically Latin, uh, Latin translated as Titian, uh, Titian brought back to life. And one of these uh, putty in the middle here has uh, actually got a Beaumont written on his wings. It's, uh, and uh, it's got Reynolds arising out of his tomb in shock. And we have a, a monkey which is uh, urinating on the contemporary artists like Jacques de Lutherberg and, and Turner themselves. It's a m quite a mockery of, uh, of, of the, 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 um, the hierarchy of, the, of um, the Royal Academy at that time. In 1803, uh, the Lake District certainly offered the Bowmans once more a place of tranquility, this time to escape the renovation at considerable expense of Collie Orton where in, in Leicestershire when Beaumont planned to uh, hang his old masters. Beaumont's sketches and, uh, and subjects at this period are often difficult to place as he did not specify a particular date. And this is a, um, one of his small lake books, which is in, in, in the company of the in care of the Tate. Uh, um, and, it's, uh, and as you can see, it's just a, a, a random mountain scene. I'd just really love to maybe one day look through that book and uh, go, go and have a little wander around all that, the lake and see if we can actually trace some of these places. I don't know if that's, uh, <laughs> if that's uh, anyone's attempted at Amy at all. Or <laughs> okay. But staying at Greta Hall that, ye uh, that year, their, their evenings were filled with conversation, as living there at that time was one Samuel Taylor Coleridge. They'd met him briefly in London, and at that, at that time, Coleridge had failed to make a favourable first impression. But Beaumont Bo Bo was very much great, willing to concede to Farrington that Coleridge was of great genius, a poet, Prodigious command of words has read everything, and of Wordsworth, a rival genius. Before parting company, uh, Beaumont, with, uh, with Coleridge's mediator, offered Wordsworth um, the deeds to land and uh, property in Applewaite, Applethwaite beneath Skiddaw. And this is a typical cottage scene uh, by Beaumont of, of, in, in Applethwaite. Now, Wordsworth, enough for it, but um, the practicalities of the expense of a renovating property uh, for Wordsworth and the strained relationship between Coleridge and Wordsworth were enough to hit for him to humbly decline the offer in a letter to Beaumont. Nevertheless, not one to miss an opportunity uh, for Wordsworth or a potential patron, Wordsworth submitted three sonnets transcribed by Dorothy Wordsworth, including the patri patriotic To the Men of Kent, as reflected in our current exhibition, to pass among Beaumont's uh, artistic circles. Certainly, uh, both Coleridge and Wordsworth were probably trying to tone down by now their Republican sentiments, uh, um, uh, so not to uh, in, inflame, um, inflame uh, the Beaumonts. But the Beaumonts, nevertheless, were to enjoy lengthy correspondences, particularly Lady Beaumont, who was keen to cement their friendship, especially as Coleridge was sending excerpts of his and Wordsworth's poetry, as well as being an enthusiastic guest at Collie Autumn himself, just as Dorothy Wordsworth nursed uh, Wordsworth, uh, Coleridge when he was feeling poorly, so Lady Beaumont took upon this duty as well. Um, and uh, but Col Coleridge spent some time at Collie Autumn shortly before he departed to Malta in 18, 1804 in the hopes that the wet Mediterranean sunshine would uh, cure him of his ills. It was actually until 1806 when Wordsworth um, would meet the Beaumonts again in the London re residence of Perona Square. But that last year had been a trying one for Wordsworth and his family. February 1805, the, um, the, the East Indiaman, the Abba Gabeni, was wrecked off Weymouth with the loss of the captain 
Wordsworth's brother, John Wordsworth. The Wordsworth had borne this loss with great fortitude, and Wordsworth himself had written at length to Beaumont as he recovered his will to continue with the completion of the prelude in his great work. Now, this beautiful painting, uh, which I believe is just on display in Dove Cottage still, yes, it's, um, it is, yeah, it is, yeah. Um, it sometimes changes because we have the Old Water uh, from, by Joseph Wright of Derby. This, is, this very much sums up all of the influences of uh, George Beaumont's past, uh, the Salvatore, the Sublime and Salvatore Rosa. Sometimes the, the, uh, even the, some of the uh, ruined scenes that you may have seen on his, on his tour through Europe, uh, like Rose, Rosedale and uh, the Flemish painting as well. But there was very much a vogue for uh, uh, la uh, seascape paintings, particularly uh, ships in dire, dire trouble and, or shipwrecks itself. In the sa very same year, Turner um, depicted a large merchant ship being, being sunk, and it was one of his first uh, works to be commissioned as a, a mezzotint. Now, when it was on display at, a, at a Beaumont's house in, in, Grosvenor ha in Grosvenor Square, Beaumont was very quite aware of the sensitivity, and he almost virtually tried to steer um, word, words worth away for it, but words I did manage to see the, 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 the painting. And it very much um, inspired him to write the, uh, um, the poems, which are elegiac uh, stanzas on the, uh, lamenting, lamenting the loss of, of John. But then again, also praising uh, Beaumont, this work of thine I blame not but commend. Oh, tis a passionate work as though the painting finally offered a reconciliation with the poet and a nature acceptance. And in a way, it was almost like a reconciliation that Wordsworth was having with nature, that, that, you know, accepting the awful power of the sea and fate itself. Now, during his time in London, Wordsworth was able to attend the Royal Academy exhibition. He would have certainly seen watercolours by Turner, including the fall of the Rhine of Schaffhausen, which is this one, um, and uh, he may have been pleasantly surprised given his experience of walking the continent himself in his earlier years, but he was in the company of someone who was, not, was, who was trying to become, who was not very favourable to Turner, um, who saw some, some of the artists around him who criticised Bowman had become institutionalised in trying to maintain the whole, a whole, a whole, a whole, a whole hierarchy of art. In fact, Beaumont, we don't know why, was very critical of Turner right from the start. Um, he said of Calais Pier, uh, oops, he said of crossing the brook, he described the, co the colours in his city when it's very much a direct homage to the Claude Lorraine Lorraine painting. His colouring had become jaundiced. And the, of Calais Pier, he described it as marble and pea soup. <laughs> and uh, it's, under, it's interesting that he mentions as it, the, the term jaundice as Turner uses a, a liver reference later on to, to Jessica. But it was also the setting up of the British institution, a private society of co uh, connoisseurs under the guise of promoting um, up-and-coming young British artists, which would really gall Turner, Colcott, and other members of the Royal Academy, who felt puppeteers should not be defined by the few. But Beaumont found initial support, including uh, from people like David Wilkie, and including the tragic Benjamin Robert Hayden, a history painter who was continually at odds with the opinion of his peers and the public. He idolised Wordsworth and painted several portraits of Beaumont, uh, as this one, which is currently on loan to us from the National Portrait Gallery in the exhibition. This is uh, Wordsworth in latter life on, on held vellum. And Wordsworth complimented Hayden in, in, li in the lines, High is our calling, friend, creative art, whether the instruments of words you use or pencil pregnant with ethereal hues. Meanwhile, Beaumont, Beaumont was engaged with taking inspiration from Wordsworth's poetry. The Beaumonts were fully behind Wordsworth in the face of criticism, considering particularly of his poems of 1807, which were not well received, and drew derision from other romantic poets such as, as Byron. In 1809, um, he, he, he paints Peter Bell, a narrative uh, based on the narrative poem that Wordsworth doesn't publish until 1819, but Beaumont had heard through a private recital of a man on a journey of repentance in the wilderness. Now the image is not very clear, but there is a Peter Bell down here by, by the cabin here. But again, it's, it, it's a sense of, it has a sense of drama looming. It's got the essence of a Salvatore Rosa painting, the dark palette, the, the gloom as well. But even painting Wordsworth's own works did not spare Beaumont from any criticism. Wordsworth said of the form, which unfortunately I don't have a, a, an illustration of, the bow was too tall, the woman is too old, 
and that Molly Fisher, their housemaid, can make now of it, but the frames are very bonny. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, there was some fruition in 1850 with the publication of Wordsworth's lyrical ballads and miscellaneous poems, which Beaumont provided illustrations and engravings, which Wordsworth uh, sent a dedication to. And at the grounds of Cole Orton, uh, it offered sanctuary to Wordsworth and Dorothy and his family. A farmhouse was loaned to them, and Wordsworth set about his other passion, landscaping the winter gardens. It was also here in 1810 that a few hours, a few hours solitude whilst Dorothy was at church, that was, uh, Wordsworth was able to pen those words, my dearest love, the first of a set of love letters to his wife Mary, despite the fact they'd been married for eight years. Cole Orton today is very much divided into private apartments, but in 1812 in the grounds there was a, rem a reminder of the collaborative nature between the poet and painter in honour of the mutual admiration for Reynolds and immortalised in oil by Constable. The cenotaph, the monument that was uh, built, uh, had on, uh, again it's not quite clear here, but on either side there were um, busts of Michelangelo and Raphael, the, the artists that Raph uh, um, Reynolds held in great esteem. Constable viewed this in 1823, made a sketch, but it wasn't until about 10 years later that he, um, he actually painted this wonderful oil, oil piece. And at the bottom of the, this, the, uh, the cenotaph is an inscription with fitting eulogy in verse that Wordsworth uh, wrote, concluding, from youth a zealous follower, a zealous follower of the art that he professed to attach himself to in heart, admiring, loving him with grief and pride, feeling what England lost when Reynolds died. If you are viewing this painting in the National Gallery, please take a moment to look around you and imagine how Beaumont's collection, once seen by the privileged few, has contributed to the magnificent collection of works and art to be enjoyed today by the many. Thank you. <laughs>